Well, we're talking, last week, we're, we've been teaching through John, and uh, last week was on the trial of Jesus. And if you remember, we talked about how Jesus is still on trial today, and the questions that he was being asked all those years ago, he's still being asked those questions today. And they're the people on the right who are, think they know how God's supposed to work, and they're trying to squeeze Jesus into their God box. And then there are the other people who aren't really sure if there is a God, but they're curious, but they're not really sure they want to buy into all the stuff. That's Pilate. And so between the Pilate and the Jewish leadership, there are these people who are trying to sort of pass judgment and ask questions and put Jesus on trial. And we sort of talked about how those of us today are still putting Jesus on trial. And we're thinking about, does he fit into my view of things, or can I even buy that? And the deal is, is the next thing after the trial comes a verdict, right? And so we're going to look at the verdict that was passed on Jesus. And again, I think, um, I think this just goes along with last week, where all of us have to decide what we think about this. And I, and I want to state at the outside that we sort of hear these, we've heard this story so many times, right? So we kind of know how it ends. We know the whole deal, but let's put yourself back in the moment or maybe put yourself in this moment. And the claims of Jesus are pretty tough to buy, aren't they? Okay, first of all, he, he essentially says, I am the son of God. So that means that there is a God, and not only is there a God, but he is intervening in the affairs of men. Well, that's a big thing to get your head around, right? Then he goes even farther and he says, not only is there a God, but you are separate from him and he wants to connect to you. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's a big deal. Then you can connect to God by believing in me. Can you see why that maybe would create skepticism and wonder and doubt in the minds of the people? Because it still creates skepticism and wonder and doubt in minds today. This is not, this is not a slam dunk. This is not an easy question. But it's an essential question. And if you are a person of, if you are a Christ follower, if you are a person of faith, this is the fundamental question of the faith. Is Jesus is laying it all on the line here. I mean, he's been nice. He, he, you know, the first part of the gospel is fun. He's healing people. He's saying cool things. Everybody's connecting with him. It's a great story. But now we're getting to the story where Jesus says, no, I, I really am. I am laying it on the line and I am going to be killed for this. And then there's this huge mystery, which you can never get, is that the people are making decisions, but it's really God's thing to save us because he loves us. These are huge, huge mysteries. Huge, huge mysteries. And you, if you sort of get it the first time, you're probably not paying attention. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> if you really take it seriously, if this is not just a story, but you believe, and Jesus kind of demands that you take it seriously. You know, there's a famous quote by C.S. Lewis where it's like, liar, lunatic, or Lord, right? I mean, he's either lying, he's crazy, or he is who he says he is. And he completely rejects the whole notion of just a good teacher. He's not claiming to be that, right? The essential part of the God story is the verdict. It's what do you think of Jesus? And if you look at the players in this story, they are all us. We are all the players in the story. So the Jewish leaders, what they want what? What do they want to, what do they want to see happen to Jesus? They want him dead. That's a pretty intense emotion, isn't it? That's an intense emotion, right? They want him dead. 
Why would they want him dead? Let's go ahead and we can throw that. Why, why do they want him dead? Because he's going against everything they're telling everybody. He's, a, he's, he's actually questioning their authority. He's saying you have no authority. He's telling them that they're wrong. Any of you guys have kids? Do you like it when they question your authority? <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> right? Well, also, uh, mm -hmm. I think they were, they were waiting for like this big triumphant king yeah. to come and basically tell the world that they they really are the chosen ones and they've been right all along and all their laws are yeah are worthwhile and and uh, when Jesus comes as a servant and says, hey, not only are you guys which are, you know mm -hmm. Gentiles are equal now. Yeah, it's an all swim. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody gets to play. No, wait seriously? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, like that movie where a king normally is uh, worshipped, never, never sacrificed. Yeah. Yeah. So he's the antithesis of what they're expecting. So, um, but I will just say this too. Look, look, in a sense, all of us, the idea of the lordship, of lordship, of somebody being my boss, somebody being over me that has a right to tell me or instruct me or change the course of how I live my life, that is abhorrent to most of us. That is abhorrent to most of us. It was abhorrent to them. He threatened their lifestyle, he had threatened their worldview, but he had threatened their power. And I would say for, for us today, Jesus does the same thing. If we say that Jesus is Lord, the worst thing about that is it means that, and I am not. And currently, most of us get to be Lord of us, right? And we have that thing of, you're not going to tell me what to do. And so essentially, this idea, if we take it seriously, many of us will kill the Jesus idea. We want it dead because we don't want anybody to be a Lord over us. That was a choice I made for a period in my life. It's like, I don't like that. It's dead to me. We want him dead. All of us are the Jewish leadership at one time or another in our lives. Pilate wanted to avoid the question and all responsibility for it, right? What did Pilate want to see happen with Jesus? What? Washed his hands. Washed his hands. Why was that important? He wanted to see him free, right? He's like, I want the problem to go away. I like a world better where there is no Jesus to mess with, right? And so it's not that he believed in him. It's just Jesus was a problem because he was disturbing his peace. And he just wanted it to go away because Jesus was not on his agenda, right? And a lot of us, even if we don't hate Jesus, we'd rather just sort of wash our hands of the deal and say, you know what, I'm not going to pay attention to all that right now. And in a sense, all of us are pilot. I think this is a cool... Also, yeah. that, uh, you, you have to make a decision on Jesus. The problem is, is if you make the decision that he is Lord, then you're going to make a whole group of people mad. And if you make a decision that he's not, you're going to make a whole group of people So you really want to not... You would love to just be ambiguous about the yeah. thing yeah. and not make anybody mad. Great point. Politics. Great point. Great point. Okay, about, how about the crowd? What did the crowd want to do with Jesus? Cream him, okay. No, free him. Oh, free him. They wanted to free him. I thought, I thought, okay. I thought that's, he's an artist. He's got a unique way of expressing himself. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then fold him in. Yeah, that's right. Well, basically, did the crowd know the whole backstory of what was going on? Are crowds usually well informed? No. No, they're kind of saying, you know what he did? Really? I hate that. <laughs> and we get a whole crowd movement of people who are ill-informed, following a leadership that they hope is correct and they believe to be right, to accomplish a desired end that they think is mostly good, right? Whether it's good or not. And it says that they, they say this amazing thing in the gospel. What, do the, what does the crowd say when they're saying about kill Jesus? Do you know what they say? There's a curse that they call down on themselves. Let the sin be upon us 
and our generations, right? Wow. It's a wild thing. And they did it because they thought, yeah, this is the right thing. And the Romans don't know what they're doing and we're going to do it. And the thing is, all of us are the crowd, right? All of us at times are ill-informed, doing what we think is right, on, based on very little information. They're also going by the laws and believing in... They're believing the stuff they thought they knew. Yeah, yeah absolutely. How about the soldiers? My contention is all of us are the soldiers, too. Mm -hmm. They were just doing their job. If anybody was probably the least culpable in this, they didn't know who he was. He was just another guy that Pilate said beat up. You know, and that's what soldiers do is they beat people up, at least in Roman times. And so they beat him up because they could, because they should, because it was their job. And actually part of their job was to sort of make fun of them too. It was about demeaning the person. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So the whole deal is, is that Jesus is still on trial and that all of us are always, are, have been characters in this play at different times in our lives. So we're going to talk about the three little parts of this story tonight. We're in John 19, tail end of 18, and then John 19. This is the beating. Okay, I make these slides, and I really wrestled on this slide because I wanted to make it really graphic, but I thought that probably wouldn't be right. But this was a horrific thing. This was a horrific thing. This wasn't a polite little beating. Even the, if you saw the... Uh, the book, the passion, or the the movie, the passion. That's close to it, but it was probably even worse than that. Um, okay, what did Pilate say about Jesus right before he beat him? He said it two verses before the beating happened. Do you remember what he said? He said he is not guilty of any crime. He is not guilty of any crime. You are innocent thinking that would get him off, but the crowd was still upset. So they said, okay, beat him. And this is kind of a point that I don't, I don't know if I'm stretching here, but I think I'm not. I think Jesus gets beat up because he could be beat up. Get beat up for no good reason. The flogging makes no sense in this journey. It really doesn't. Pilate says, you're innocent. The crowd is pushing for crucifixion. He says, okay, we'll flog him. And the flogging, I'll just, so you probably have heard this, but it's a, it's a whip that has pieces of lead and goat's bones in it. And you've heard about the 39 lashes, probably, that there was a rule that there were only 39 lashes. Do you know whose rule that was? That was a Jewish rule. It was Jesus being beaten by Jewish people. Romans didn't have that rule. There was no limit to the beating. And the way that they did this is that they strung them up on a post so that their back was tight. They stripped them naked and they had two guards on either side and they just beat them till they were done. And with the very first blow, it would draw blood. I guess what I'm trying to say in this is that with these things of all, somehow we've got a hallmark version of all this stuff. And this was ugly and horrific and bloody and bad. But my thing is, is that I think we beat up Jesus sometimes too. And we beat him up because we can, right? It was interesting to me in this whole debate, and I, I try not to do political stuff here because I'm not a that's not the point but it is interesting to me as I was preparing this talk this week that we had all those people killed for their faith in Egypt Christians that were killed for their faith and through history how have Christians responded to martyr martyrdom they have mostly submitted Jesus said if someone slaps you on the right cheek turn the other cheek as well. Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute, persecute you. And in this beating, in this whole thing of the crucifixion, 
Jesus teaches it and then he demonstrates it. He is saying that the way of the kingdom and the way of Christians throughout the ages, with some notable exceptions, <laughs> has been to submit and to believe that the power of God and that the power of love would change things. And the Roman government was eventually became Christian because the Christian would go in and serve the sick and the needy when everybody else left, left and hid. And that when the people tried to abolish them in the arena, they submitted and they sang. And the stories of the martyrs are an amazing thing. We had martyrs this week on the, on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea in Egypt who sang and said, may this glorify Jesus as their lives were taken out. This story is a potent story. This is a potent story. It has lasted for more than 2000 years. And people say, yeah, that's the way I want to live. And it's different. For, I was in India. You guys have heard me say this before, but to me, it's so, it's so stark. And my, we were talking about how bad the traffic was in India. And he says, and my friend who is a native Indian and a Christian, he says, it's because they aren't Christians here. And I go, what? And he says, because Christians were taught to prefer one another in love. Whereas the Hindu religion says, you don't care about anybody. It's all karma. You get what you're going to get. They get what they want to get. They had no hospitals in India until Christian missionaries came. Christian missionaries were the first ones to create hospitals because if a person was sick, that was their karma. This is a radical teaching that Jesus is about. He is saying, I mean it when I said, love one another, lay down your life for one another. So the beating is, you get what I mean when it's like, have you ever beat up Jesus? You sort of take it for granted if you're a Christian because you know he's going to forgive you anyway, right? <laughs> God's got to forgive me, so I'll be a little bit bad. I'll beat him up, you know. It says in scripture, by his stripes, we are healed. And I'm, I don't mean this, I can feel my, you know, it's like, I've heard preachers spin this in a way where it's like, you're beating him up. You are putting the straps on Jesus. You know, it's like, I don't mean it that way. But there is a sense in which because of his love, we take advantage and we beat it up, beat him up. And he does and he continues to love and he continues to draw us to himself. But this beating was there for no good reason. It serves no purpose in the story. It's like, we're going to kill him another way, but let's go ahead and beat him up now. I think we do. Say again? But I think I do, if I could speak on my own. Um, yeah, I'd rather you not confess my sins. Yeah. Just confess your own, so, yeah. Um, but um, you say all the time that sin is walking further away from God. It's what separates and us, yeah. so that would hurt him because we're his children and he loves us mm -hmm. and wants nothing more than to draw us nine closer to him. So seeing us going further away would be like a beating inside the heart, like when we see our children straying or, or not. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've got it. So the, the exoneration is the next thing. This is, this is one of the most interesting things to me. I, you know, I, I've heard this story forever, but when I was studying it this week, it just really jumped out at me. So every time that Pilate passes a sentence on Jesus, what is the sentence that he passes? Innocence. Innocence. You are innocent. You are not guilty. I find nothing wrong with this man. Three different times, Pilate says, I don't see anything wrong with what you've done. And then after he says that, he winds up saying, take him yourselves and crucify him, but I find him not guilty. Then the Jewish leaders replied, by our law, he ought to die because he called himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever before. He took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. He says, why don't you talk to me, Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you? And then Jesus said, you have no power over me at all unless it were given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. 
I think that's one of the most amazing passages in the Bible because it reveals all the stuff that happened in the garden where Jesus sort of submits. I mean, the garden, he's like, Lord, I don't really want to do this. And by saying, I don't really want to do this, I mean, he was sweating blood. <laughs> it's like he did not want to do this. But he resolved himself to it. And the interesting thing, and I'm going to go really quick because I'm going long as usual, uh, is that Jesus is declared to be completely pure and righteous, and then he is sacrificed. I don't know if any of y'all are doing the readings. We've been reading through Leviticus, and it's all about the perfectly pure sacrifice that has to be given for sin. And Jesus was declared pure, and then he was sacrificed for us. 1 John 2 says, Jesus Christ, righteous Jesus, when he, was, when he served as a sacrifice for our sins, he solved the sin problem for good. Not only ours, but the whole world's. Pilate was the first person to go, huh? You're what? There's a higher power than me? I don't think so, right? Anyway, we're going out of order, but the next slide and the final is the swap. And this is, to me, kind of a, this is the end of the whole, one of the most telling things. So Jesus is swapping his innocence for Barabbas's guilt and that we are all Barabbas. So let me just give you a little background on Barabbas. Do you know how uh, si G Peter was called uh, Simon Bar-Jonah, I believe? Is that right? Simon Bar, something like that. Bar means son of, right? So Jesus was Jesus Bar-Joseph, right? Bar-Abbas is son of a rabbi. So he was the son of a rabbi. He was most likely a zealot, which means a fanatical person who was trying to fight against Rome and free Israel from their power. And it's if you read the Syrian texts, they put in that Barabbas' first name was Jesus. So is it Jesus Barabbi or Jesus Bar Joseph that you want to be released to me? Jesus was a very common name back, back then. Well, you guys can probably guess where I'm going. He was a well-intentioned zealot. He was not just a common criminal. He was a guy who was trying to do a good thing the best he knew how and had set himself against the powers that be and he had failed. And people wanted him rather than Jesus, right? So Jesus swapped his innocence for Barabbas's guilt. He's still doing that today, right? All of us are Barabbas. All of us are guilty. All of us are chasing our own ends for our own desires, thinking that they're good. But only Jesus can redeem. So I'm going to, so John, or Romans 3, 21 through 28 says, but now God has shown us this way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We were made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, for everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. And yet God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. And this sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in the present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just. And he declares sinners to be right in his sight when we believe in Jesus. Can we boast then that what we have that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. All right, final slide. That's, we need to, I'm so resistant. Paul's, you've got me so afraid to use my preacher voice, but this is all preacher voice stuff, man. This is all, you need to hum this stuff, you know. This is like, you know, you got to decide, you know. It's like, but it's the truth. We all are faced with this question. 
and we all every day declare our verdict. I'll just close with this. Pilate chose compromise and he ended up a murderer of innocent men. The crowd chose Barabbas and ended up crucifying the son of God. Jesus chose the cross and ended up king of kings and Lord of lords. And the question is, what will we choose? What will we choose? I guess the thing I want us to walk away with, and I hope you see, Man, it's been said so many times, it's hard to find a way to say it fresh. Is that God loves us so much that he gave his son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him they might find life. This is an amazing love story. Jesus really did lay down his life for us. And God really did it. I'll let you know the secret. In a couple of weeks, there's going to be a resurrection. And all the stuff that was improbable and bad will be broken. And a whole new world and a whole new paradigm will be shifted. But before you get the good stuff, you have to take serious all the bad stuff. And this week in Jesus' life is the bad stuff. He really did take the hate and the abuse and the worst that the world had to give, all their power. And he, had, he accepted the beating. He accepted their coercive force so that he could change it into the force of love and let, let's say that love is stronger than hate. And all those things are really, really true. Love changes stuff. Hate does not. The love of God is the only good thing in the world. Without it, everything falls short. And Jesus said, I've been doing all this. Just choose me. Just choose me. All right. I've said enough and you know it. All right. Here is the encounter. If you want to choose him, if you want to encounter God, we have communion. And communion was this thing that Jesus said. He said every week when you come in my name, I'll be there. And this is your encounter with Christ. The bread represents his body that was broken and his, the blood represents his blood that was shed. And as we partake of it, we encounter him. So if you have stuff you need to get off your chest, take it to the table, take it to Jesus. If you have things that you need to uh, surrender, take it there. If you have doubts, take them there. And encamp- be open to his intervention. Lord, we, uh, I am grateful for the way you love us. I am, I am amazed at what you endured. And Lord, I just pray that we will find you that we will see you, that we will humble ourselves and allow you to move in our hearts and change us so that we can love the way we want to love, the way you want us to love, and that we can walk the way in the freedom that you are calling us to. Lord, I pray that we will see your light and that we will experience your goodness and that we will trust you above ourselves. Our Father, we declare you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Whenever you're ready, come and take communion. And when we're all through, we'll have our meal together.